Hello and welcome to today's seminar, which is the second in our series on extreme urbanism, a view on Afghanistan. Today's topic center around traditional architecture and urbanism in Afghanistan. I'm Chelsea Farrell, the Assistant Director of the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University. The mission of the Institute is to engage through interdisciplinary research to advance and deepen the understanding of critical issues relevant to South Asia and its relationship with the world. Before we get started, we have a couple of housekeeping items for today. During the question and answer session, you can submit questions directly to the moderator via the Q&A function on Zoom. There will be a short survey automatically sent to you at the end of the session. We would ask that you kindly fill this out. Finally, today's session will be recorded. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the moderator of today's panel, Dr. Charlotte Malter Bart. Charlotte is an architect, scholar, and assistant professor of urban design at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. She holds a PhD from ETH Zurich on the effects of the political economy of food on the built environment, case study Egypt. Charlotte's teaching and research interests are related to how struggling communities can gain greater access to resources, the mainstream economy, better governance, and ecological and social justice. She co-authored Housing Cairo and Cairo Desert Cities by Ruby Press in Berlin. She is a founding member of the Parity Group, a grassroots association committed to improving gender equality in architecture. Dr. Maltair Bart, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Chelsea, for this um, great introduction. Um, I have indeed the honor to moderate the second session of our Extreme Urbanism series. Um, today, the panel on traditional architecture of Afghanistan co-hosted by the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asian Institute and the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, this event is born out of the Option Studio Extreme Urbanism, uh, Imagining an Urban Future for Ishkashim, uh, offered at the Harvard GSD in the fall of 2020, initiated by Professor Rahul Marotra that I have the pleasure to co-instruct with. Um, so this series aimed to propose to interested audiences the opportunity to get an updated, uh, informed view on the country. Uh, and we already have behind us the first session, Planning for Urban Afghanistan. And on October 24th, we'll be hosting um, our third and last panel, Contemporary Architecture and Urbanism in Afghanistan. Um, before jumping at the heart of the matter and, and uh, introducing our speakers, uh, we would like to thank, uh, of course, the uh, Lakshmi Mittal and Family South East Asia Institute and its uh, fantastic team, um, Nina, Selman and Chelsea, thank you very much. Um, and in the name of the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, which is also the partner um, of our studio um, at Harvard. In Afghanistan, we'd like to thank the Ministry of Urban Development and Land and in particular, uh, Mrs. Sahar Hamdar. Uh, who has been lecturing for our students and, and uh, has been extremely helpful. Uh, the Directorate of Urban Development and Land of Badakhshan, uh, the Municipality of Ishkashim and the District Governor of Ishkashim, as well as Kabul University, who is also our partner um, for this studio. Um, and so with this session, we, what we hope is to get an on look uh, onto traditional architecture and urbanism in Afghanistan, uh, on vernacular and building traditions, on questions of maintenance and preservation of historic settlements. Um, and we are very happy and delighted to have as speakers today, Sofia Sahab, Ayaz Hosham, and Abdul Wasan Ajimi. And I would like to um, start by introducing our first speaker, which is um, Sofia Sahab. Sofia Sahab is a former lecturer at the Department of Urban and Planning Department. She holds a Bachelor of uh, Architecture from Kabul University and a Master's and PhD in Urban Planning from uh, Nagoya Institute of Technology in Japan. She joined the Architecture Department of Kabul University in 2010 as the first female instructor and transferred um, to the newly established Urban Design and Planning Department in 2018 to become then the first head of this department um, for a year. Uh, Dr. Sahab also worked for the Ministry of Urban Development and Housing as an urban regeneration uh, specialist. So, um, Ustad Sofia, the floor is yours. I will um, then introduce each of the speakers um, prior to their talk. And just one short um, uh, point, uh, we'll be taking questions uh, by chat uh, in written form. So please uh, do feel free to, to formulate your question and send them um, during the entire session. Um, so with no further 
delay, I leave um, the floor to um, Ustad Sofia. Uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, looking good. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. I'm Sofia uh, Sahab, uh, former member of uh, the Department of Urban Design and Planning. And uh, today I'm going to uh, present about Gozo, Afghanistan's traditional neighborhood. And this is the outline of my today's presentation. First, I'd like to talk about the traditional gozer, the characteristics of these gozers, and then about the current or the urbanized gozers. And then I will present about my own research that I have done during my master's and PhD and now also. Uh, it includes the special features of the gozers and also the functional, uh, the functions of gozers that was a, a questionnaire survey with rep representatives and online discussion uh, system. Uh, first about the uh, traditional gozers, uh, the term uh, gozer literally means uh, the pass or passage uh, Gozer is a uh, centuries old uh, traditional neighborhoods found in Kabul city and other cities of Afghanistan. And uh, unfortunately, we do not have much literature about the Gozers. Uh, and as my research has been uh, about the Gozers in Kabul city, uh, so I, um, I generally talk about the characteristics of Gozers in Kabul city that might be very similar to other gozers in like a Herat city or mazar sharif but it might have uh, some uh, differences. So my, uh, my research is on the gozers in Kabul city. Uh, uh, before we had uh, master plans or any plans for Kabul city, uh, we had such kind of divisions like uh, Kabul was divided into mahas, uh, it was like uh, the districts, now we call this uh, as municipal district or ward and the gozer, that is kind of neighborhood or community. And that was also called as Mahala. Mahala is also called in, uh, in, uh, as neighborhoods in, uh, in neighboring countries like Iran, Uzbekistan and Turkey. And also we had such kind of divisions like Kocha, it is a street or alley. Uh, it, it doesn't mean here that uh, these divisions, one division were the main division or the other is the subdivision because we don't have literature on these things. But uh, Gozar and Mahal sometimes used uh, interchangeably and Gozar and Kocha also used interchangeably. So uh, we had such kind of divisions in Kabul city, but we, we do not have much information or literature about it. The main characteristics of these gozer were uh, they had uh, or they, they were led by a representative or wakil, we, uh, we uh, usually call them as wakil, and uh, they were uh, in, they included or was organized around a religious building or mosque, and uh, they also included a school. Uh, the, this religious building was also kind of a school and included uh, retail shops and market. And they also included uh, uh, spaces for the community. And uh, the one thing that was very strong in these gozers were the, uh, the uh, social ties among its residents and the, um, the gozer representative, that uh, these social ties brought up mutual aid, social and physical order in them. Uh, the thing that was more common in these gozers were the common guild among the residents in the gozer in, uh, uh, in the name, uh, like uh, in this uh, slide, uh, I'm, I'm uh, going to uh, present about the names of this, like the names of each gozer, um, each gozer had a name, and most often the name represented the common guild of the residents um, in the gozer, like we had gozer ahangari, its, its translation is forging gozer or, or soap making gozer or other strassil gozer. 
and uh, they were also named after popular and influential people who once inhabited in the Gozer or according to particular areas or certain geographical landmarks in the Gozer. Uh, how about the current, the characteristics of the current or urbanized Gozer? Uh, they are currently institutionalized as sub-districts of municipal district uh, or municipal governance. Uh, they are also uh, represented by a representative. This is a must, also not written anywhere, but they should have a representative. And uh, they uh, include mosques. When I had the survey, we had like one Gozar had even 10 mosques, one had uh, one mosque, but there were no Gozar without a mosque. Uh, this area is used, um, uh, mosque is used for the information sharing uh, by Gozar representative. And um, they had set or customary boundaries. The, def the sizes are quite different, very large sizes. We have very, very large sizes of Gozar and small size of Gozer. And uh, in a district, uh, it, it ranges from one to 110. Uh, usually there are 500 to 1,000 uh, 1, uh, houses in a Gozer. And uh, the citizen charter uh, suggests 1,000 to 1,250 households for each Gozer. So why, uh, why Gozer is important? Uh, you know that uh, over 70% of uh, Kabul city's urban fabric is informal and uh, they are or, uh, recognized by the municipality, by their Gozer organizations. So it's kind of formal bridge for municipality to informal settlements. They play a very important role in the local governance of informal settlements Wakili Gozers or the Gozer representatives act as conduit of information between Gozer residents and municipality. Uh, they're also responsible for certifying documents, births, marriages, and deeds. The, the Gozer representatives are like uh, working as volunteer, but their responsibility is kind of formal responsibility. So this is kind of uh, making Gozer as a, as a formal, urban uh, governance unit, municipal governance unit. This is my research, is, uh, my research about Gozer. First, I had a Gozer spatial feature survey and then a functional survey with Gozer representatives and uh, other Gozer function survey with the residents. Uh, the first one is uh, about Gozar uh, special features. I surveyed four districts and uh, that included one, 24 Gozars. Uh, I used the maps that were uh, in the um, uh, district's uh, office and also it was uh, shared by JICA to me. And uh, I, I draw those uh, Gozar boundaries in the aerial maps and measure the the area and the, and the number of houses in the Gozers. And this is the, the summary of those findings. We can see that we have very large Gozers in terms of area and number of housing units or population and very small ones too. So, so the Gozer size is not like a, a formalized to 500 or 600 houses. It's, uh, the range is very long, uh, large. Uh, my second survey was about Gozer functions. Uh, it was uh, a questionnaire survey with uh, Wakili Gozer. Uh, I surveyed four districts that are shown in this map uh, uh, and uh, 82 Gozers. Uh, these four districts had uh, 124 uh, Gozers, but uh, I, uh, we had questionnaire survey to 82 Gozer representatives. Uh, the main contents of this uh, questionnaire survey was aerial characteristics, neighborhood functions, and activeness of users. Uh, this is, uh, these are the photos of that uh, questionnaire during uh, the questionnaire, my questionnaire survey. Uh, as you can see that all the kilo users were uh, male. Uh, we didn't have uh, any female representative. Now I think we have one or two female representatives too, but on that time uh, there were no female representative. And uh, most of uh, the age of the 
most working users uh, were higher than 50. Uh, the, the literacy was also not very high. Like so we had uh, illiterate uh, wakils also, and um, the 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 wakils uh, duration of being as a as a representative were even more than 20 years. And the younger ones were the the son of those wakils that had passed away, and their son had become the wakil guzar. Uh, so this was the functions that uh, I had, I surveyed, and this shows the results that which functions, uh, according to the Gozar representatives, work well in the Gozars and which functions does not work well. And here we can see that some functions like traditional events, uh, holding recreational activities, or these things does not work very well or not work anymore in the Gozars, but some functions like uh, the, the governance functions work quite well in the Gozers. And also we had these aerial characteristics of Gozers and activeness of Gozers. And uh, for seeing whether these are uh, uh, related to each other, I did some statistical uh, tests. And uh, this is a short summary of those uh, tests that neighborhood functions were not um, uh, affected by the population size or the Gozer establishment period, but uh, it was related to the settlement type. And uh, Gozers with formal settlements uh, had better functions, these functions written here. And so this indicates that a formalization or a special arrangements um, is uh, likely to enhance neighborhood functions of Gozers. Uh, this is my third uh, survey. Uh, here I did it uh, uh, this year from uh, May 12 to May 29. We used the uh, online discussion system. It is called uh, Collegory with the collaboration of Kabul Municipality and also Nagoya Institute of Technology. We covered all the districts of Kabul City uh, and uh, we asked the residents to, the residents or Makili Gozars and everyone to participate, we had 800 participants. And uh, as our system was uh, facilitated by AI and operated by AI, the AI itself uh, um, classified the opinions into issues, ideas, merits, and demerits. And I don't like to discuss a lot about this. It's not published yet. And um, my time is also, I think, um, over. But we had three teams in this, uh, in this uh, uh, survey was our general functions. We asked the residents to talk about what functions generally Gozars now have and what were the working well functions and what are solutions to not working well functions. So this was kind of like we, we wanted to know the Gozar uh, functions from the residents' point of view because we had them from the representatives' point of view. But also we wanted to um, enhance the neighborhood social functions of Gozers by soft methods of participation. Uh, this is a user interface of uh, our online discussion system. And uh, uh, that was all at the end. I'd like to say that uh, uh, as a conclusion that uh, we should, uh, I consider Gozers as a very important social, um, socially or, or physical uh, neighborhoods uh, or uh, governance units. And we should consider in each plan, whether it's a master plan or detailed plan or any other plan of Kabul city. Um, so uh, thank you very much. This was my presentation. Thank you, um, Ustad Sofia, for your presentation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we will be um, taking the questions by uh, chat. So if you have uh, any question for um, Sofia Sahab um, on her presentation or more generally, please um, do that. Um, so I would now like to introduce our second speaker, um, Ayaz Hoshan. Um, Ayaz Hosham is a lecturer at the Department of Architecture and Design in Kabul Engineering Faculty. 
uh, before completing his master's from Hiroshima University in 2019, he worked as an assistant architect for the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. And since 2019, he's also working um, as a sustainable architect specialist for the Office of the Senior Advisor of the President for Transportation Affairs. And he's a practicing architect who recently established his studio in Kabul, uh, a studio called Nokta, which means point in Farsi. Um, so, uh, Ustad Hosham, please, the floor is yours and you may share your screen. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Charlotte. I would like to start my presentation. <coughs> uh, so good evening and good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the uh, Harvard GSD program, Kabul University al Khan Habitat and the Lakshmi Mental Institute for this opportunity. Uh, so what happens is that uh, 50 years ago, professors from Harvard University and Kabul University, uh, the did some research and they published one of the most uh, fundamental texts in the uh, domain of the indigenous architecture of Afghanistan. That uh, book together with uh, the publications from Professor Kazimi, Professor Samizai and uh, Dr. Najimi, who is also joining the panel today, uh, are the fundamental text uh, regarding the traditional architecture for those who want to study in this field. After that, there were some articles uh, published, but not a major study. So on the other hand, uh, what happen what's happening now uh, around the globe is the issue of global warming, climate change, and the role of the built environment in uh, this man-made catastrophe. So, oh, and a lot of studies are going on in the vernacular architecture, and they are looking at the vernacular architecture. They are looking at the vernacular architecture to, uh, to find passive uh, technologies and then to introduce that into the contemporary architecture and to, uh, uh, in order to reduce the energy consumption. So what we did was to add another layer to the study that was carried out 50 years ago and to study the one of these houses, which is the Kabul courtyard houses, and to find out the passive and low energy heating and cooling techniques, and to introduce it for the contemporary architects to have a sense of uh, regional character, and also to reduce the energy consumption when they are designing the buildings. So today I will talk about the environmental sustainability in the vernacular architecture. And also I will uh, talk about the courtyard houses of Kabul and my research in Hiroshima University. Uh, so Afghanistan has witnessed uh, a lot of uh, empires actually. We have experienced uh, expansion and contraction at the same time. We have hosted several uh, types of several dynasties, civilizations, or empires, and sometimes we have nurtured these empires. So for example, we can start by Alexander, the Kushani Empire, who were Buddhist, and then the Ghaznavid, who were Muslim, and the capital was in Ghazni, and then we were also not safe from the Mongols. The Chinggis Khan army uh, invaded our country and destroyed most of the cities. And after that, we experienced the Timurid period, and Herat was the uh, center of that flourishing uh, civilization at that time. And this was followed by the rivalry between the Mughals and Safavids who were controlling the eastern and western parts of the country. So uh, after that, from the power vacuum, we, uh, there was another uh, empire called the Durrani Empire, <clears throat> whose uh, and the emperor was Ahmad Shah Durrani, who established the modern day Afghanistan. So what, uh, and it wasn't the modern day Afghanistan actually, it was when the Afghanistan name was given to the country and the empire was from Isfahan to Delhi and it was uh, the biggest in the history uh, for the Afghan. So, and uh, the current borders of the country were uh, 
somehow finalized during uh, King Abdurrahman Khan, and then you know the history, the British, uh, the British uh, came and then the Soviets, and now we are also facing a major change. So what the point that I want to make in here is that we have experienced a diverse empires. So the diverse empires have left diverse ethnicities in the country. So what we come up in here is that uh, these are the ethnic groups in Afghanistan. I haven't mentioned the names. It's a very sensitive case still in Afghanistan. And it is considered one of the reasons of instability in the country. But for architects, I think it is the main, it is one of the positive points to be noted uh, and, uh, in the country because diverse ethnicities create diverse type of living and then diverse buildings. So one of the major influencers of the buildings and houses in Afghanistan and in this region is the ethnicities. On top of that, we have the geography and the climate. So the geography uh, changes, actually the altitude changes from the 7,000 meters to 200 meters above sea level in one region. And this has resulted in a very diverse type of uh, climate. So uh, overall, the climate is arid and, uh, and dry, but we have uh, different alterations. Uh, for example, in the northeast part of the country, we have a severely cold climate and only nomadic people live there and the others cannot survive. And in the southwest part of the country, we have desert climate, uh, but uh, the deserts are inhabitable. So what happened is that the cities developed along the rivers in strategic locations and also in plain uh, fields. For instance, uh, you can see uh, uh, Kabul city, Kandahar city, and Herat city, and Balkh. Uh, if you see the geography, they were all uh, located in plain fields. One, one of the effects of this type of geography was that um, the, the mountain, the mountainous areas are not uh, cultivatable, so they can be only used by the nomads for the or shepherds. So one type of people that we have in, Af in Afghanistan is the nomads. So the nomads have their own type of housing that is flexible and to be and uh, flexible and movable. Those are, this is the first category of houses that we can find, which can be said as non sedentary dwellings. So uh, usually in the uh, southern and southern eastern parts, they take the shape of tent. More variations have been developed in each part, but usually it's a tent that provides shade and also privacy for the household. Uh, but on the northern part of the country, and uh, especially near Uzbekistan and Central Asia, they still have the yurts or the conical shaped tents that uh, has more insulation and they use local heating and they want to avoid the heat produced inside to, to, to go out or to lose the heat. Uh, so in terms of the environmental sustainability and in terms of the passive heating and cooling, the black tents, uh, they does not provide a lot of uh, uh, insulation for the households, but what they do is that they shift from one place to, one, to another place uh, for finding thermal comfort. So in these types of buildings, the buildings itself shifts to another place and they have to be shiftable. Especially you can see that in the caravans, they, the camels uh, or the horses move the house from one place to another place. So it should be flexible, uh, easy to, to uh, open and close. And also uh, it, they shift from one place to another to find thermal comfort. The other type of the buildings which we believe that are the most uh, the, the, the most uh, uh, true vernacular architecture of the country are the houses that were built uh, in the rural areas who were cut off uh, partly from the uh, the main trade routes or the main city or the centers of economy 
And these houses, for example, exist in Nuristan. They have their own typology of houses, which is similar somehow to the houses in Gilgit in Pakistan, or, or the houses in Saland, or other parts of the country that were uh, not, the, the, they did not have the access to the main uh, sources of economy or the craftsman. So what they had to do was to develop their own solutions using the local material, using the context and uh, using whatever they had. And they came up, came up with these ingenious solutions. For example, in the houses in Nuristan, they used the earth insulation. So they, they, the house is protected from the mountain, uh, from the uh, heat. Um, uh, with them uh, through the mountain from the back and also the house receives solar uh, energy from the front from the southern side and also they have a thick layer of thermal mass that uh, helps, uh, helps with the insulation and they use the local material that nothing is imported and they use it in a very uh, ingenious way because it was developed over centuries so if if we have these developed houses over centuries in local areas, I think it is worth studying them and learning from what our grandfathers or ancestors uh, did to cope with the climate. So the, uh, the third type of houses are the towns of, in the cities. So the cities were centers of trade. So the trade routes passed the cities and uh, they were the capital of empires, uh, Herat, Balkh, Kabul, and Kandahar. And they were the center of economy and also the center of culture. So they developed different types of houses, which were sometimes also influenced by the empire itself. So if the empire is vast enough, then the builders will come to the main capital and build uh, using their own knowledge or know-how. And uh, so for instance, the courtyard houses of Herat, uh, they use the uh, wind during the summer, they have a seasonal wind, they use the wind, they use the wind catchers as you can see in the picture. They take the wind from the rooftops, evaporate it using the water and the wind becomes wet and cool and enters the house or the courtyard, which is a way of cooling the house or the courtyard. And similarly, the houses in Kandahar used basements or thick thermal mass and the courtyard as uh, passive strategies and the houses in Balkh had the domed shaped structures that helped the thermal stratification in, of air inside the, inside the rooms. And similarly in the houses, uh, quartered houses of Kabul, we were interested to study these houses because uh, first of all, they were uh, on the verge of uh, extension and they were being destroyed. And secondly, we wanted to uh, study them because they are the unique type of houses in the region. Uh, some ex uh, similar examples can be found in Peshawar, areas near Kabul, which were part of the same empire sometime. But no studies has been uh, carried out on these houses, especially on the passive uh, heating and cooling techniques. So, so the houses are located in Kabul. The, the red dot shows the house uh, the location of the city. The graph shows the air temperature and relative humidity comparison of Kabul and Hiroshima, just to show you how the, how the air is dry and the, the winter is cold and dry. And on the other hand, Hiroshima is uh, humid and hot to give you a sense of the, the climate. So the residential buildings in Kabul evolved uh, from time to time. The courtyard houses were used during the Mughals and also the Durrani uh, Empire. And then the, it was the, the independence came and then we had uh, the colonial style houses. The, we had the villa inside the uh, perimeter. And then after that, during the modernization, we had the European style of houses, which was more uh, in, in a grid uh, city, in a grid uh, shape or a grid layout in the city. And after that, uh, we experienced war and less construction was done during that time. And then the reconstruction period was a very drastic change in the housing sector of Afghanistan, uh, especially in Kabul. A lot of money was poured into the country 
uh, but the regulating bodies and also the architects were not able to control that. So local uh, builders built these houses that, as you can see from the housing typology, occupied almost 90% of the land, no uh, controls on shading and insulation and, uh, and excessive decoration. So what we want to do is to, to reintroduce the courtyard house typology uh, and within the contemporary urban fabric and uh, introduce it to the architects to, to use it in their designs. So these are the previous literature, as I said, uh, the courtyard houses have been studied before. They have been also studied in Kabul, but this is the first uh, in-depth research on their thermal environment. So we carried the field study in a neighborhood of Kabul called Murad Khani. We chose five houses. Uh, there were, we had a lot of limitations. We couldn't exceed the number of houses for this research. The houses now function as a technical institute for an NGO. So these are the alley views and also the courtyard views and indoor view of the houses. Uh, you can see the wooden structure and also the high thermal mass used in these houses and a very narrow shaded alleys, just like any other Islamic city. So uh, our case study houses had different types of courtyards. That was the reason we chose, because we want to introduce uh, different, that, uh, we want to introduce the merits and demerits of different type of courtyards to, to the Afghan architects. We studied the outdoor conditions using the weather station and also we studied the thermal environment of the courtyard, the air temperature, relative humidity, the vertical distribution of air temperature, uh, thermal comfort, surface temperature, and also uh, indoor surface temperature and indoor ther uh, thermal conditions. So we also checked the sky view factor of the courtyard as an influencing factor. But uh, yeah, I don't want to go very technical, so we will keep it very general this time. You can see the ground floor of the houses have a, a very thick thermal insulation, and the first floor has relatively less thermal insulation. Thermal envelope, or the house has uh, thinner walls. These are the case study houses with different courtyards. So I want to jump directly into the indoor thermal environment, the results. So during the summer, what happened was that the, the, the courtyard was calm. You can see the wind speed in the courtyard versus the wind speed on the outdoor. So that means the courtyard sheltered the people. But the important thing was that the indoor temperature, the peak indoor temperature inside the houses, it shifted based on the rotation of the sun. So for instance, the east, the western rooms received sun earlier, so the peak was earlier than the southern rooms and then the eastern rooms and the northern, northern rooms didn't, uh, sorry, the northern rooms, and then the southern rooms didn't receive uh, direct solar radiation. Uh, what was interesting was the environment of the basements, which I will show in the next slide. And also we had a double layer of houses. So the houses with double layer are shown in here. I hope you can see the, my, my drawings. Uh, they have a relatively stable thermal environment. So what happened was that they had thick uh, thermal insulation, thick thermal mass envelope, and it was insulated by another house on the back. So this was a regulated, um, thermally regulated room, which, which was interesting to see. And the other rooms differed based on the solar radiation or the solar uh, rotation during the day. So the, the environment of the basement was the interesting. The coolest area in the house, even during the peak uh, air, uh, peak daily air temperature, was the basement that was completely closed. So the basement, which is H1B2, was completely closed. We didn't let the air inside, so it was as cool as the lowest air temperature during the 24 hours. Even uh, if we closed, if, even if we opened the windows, the basements were not uh, affected a lot. They were still 
four or five degrees cooler than the outdoor peak temperature. This shows that people use these basements, uh, people could have used these basements during the peak summertime, especially during 12 to two o'clock in the, during the day. Another thing was the use of night ventilation and also the closed conditions. So as you can see in the second graph, we opened the windows during the night just to see the effect of the night ventilation. So the night that we opened the window, we were able to lower the peak air temperature of the house on the following day by two degrees uh, Celsius. So this was an achievement. This is regardless of the courtyard shape. It was just an experiment to see what things work in the cobble climate or not. So we can use this technique in the modern houses. So during the winter, similar uh, thing happened. The houses that received the sun earlier were had warmer conditions than the, than the other rooms. Uh, around the courtyard. But important thing was that people in these houses migrated into summer and winter rooms. So the, we checked the thermal comfort and winter room and we evaluated the northern wing of the house. Then the thermal comfort was uh, achievable and they had relatively good uh, or comfortable environment in those rooms. On the other radiation, direct solar radiation, they were cool. Uh, it was also uh, worthy, it is also worthy to note that, uh, as you can see in this graph, the house is, uh, this, is due, this is when the heater was on. So what happened is that the behavior of people was, uh, was an interesting thing for us because if you can see during the peak hours, the thermal comfort index shows uncomfortable situation, which was, which was unbearable actually, but people felt comfortable. So this might show the, the thermal adaptation or the thermal preference of Afghans because we tend to be warmer or we have to feel a lot warmer than our comfort zone in order to be satisfied with our thermal environment. And this has to change because otherwise it is, it is going to have excessive energy consumption uh, and it, it will be very difficult for the, for the government to control once the economy boosts, once we have more middle class economies. So uh, we checked the outdoor thermal comfort in the two courtyards. One was a big courtyard and the second was a, uh, a relatively small courtyard, so this one and this one, here and here. So what we noticed was both courtyards were uh, protected from the hot and cold wind during the, during the winter and summer, which is really important to have an outdoor, semi-outdoor uh, space and people can actually live there during uh, some parts of the day or in the night. In the biggest courtyard, which received more solar radiation during the winter, the, the courtyard was more comfortable, especially the northern part, which received solar radiation and was protected from the cold winds. Uh, on the other hand, the medium courtyard, which was a little bit higher and didn't receive a lot of solar radiation, was not as comfortable as the, 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 the bigger courtyard. Uh, on the other hand, during the summer, the peak time of the day when the solar radiation is at its highest uh, or at its peak value, uh, both courtyards were not uh, habitable or comfortable for, for the occupants. And this is, uh, this, is, this is actually true because people never used them during the, during the noon. People went to the basement or the southern rooms during the noon but people used the courtyards during the night to sleep. So we used, we actually validated this concept and we checked that in the summer, uh, the, the lower part of the graph shows during uh, the night conditions. So you can see the night conditions, they were comfortable. So what, what happens is that if based on this type of houses, if we can also 
introduce a, a migration or techniques or at least the choices for the people to, to shift based on their uh, necessity, we can reduce the energy consumption. So in these houses, what happened was that uh, people migrated vertically and horizontally. So vertically people migrated from the roof where they slept during the night to the courtyard and then to the basement or the northern rooms in a summer, summer day to avoid the heat and stay in the shade. And the courtyard was also protected with, from the hot and dry air. And similarly, they moved horizontally on the season basis. So they moved from the northern rooms that they used during the winter to the southern rooms that they use for summer uh, to avoid the solar radiation. Uh, so these were the techniques that we found and we validated them using the scientific uh, data collection. Uh, nevertheless, the basements were found to be the coolest spaces, uh, actually the, the uh, coolest spaces during the summer and also the second layer of the houses that had that were attached to the neighbor from one side and also protected from the courtyard or outdoor air from the other side with another room. They were found to be uh, uh, shaded. So that's why they had uh, regulated uh, building uh, thermal environment, which, which can be used in the, in the modern uh, houses. So this was my uh, presentation. I hope uh, I conveyed what I wanted in this short period of time. And we were able to, to, to use from these techniques in the contemporary building. We will uh, require an alteration in the urban fabric because the current urban fabric does not allow for uh, courtyard houses of bigger, bigger, uh, sizes or bigger proportions, but uh, we can produce or we can present or introduce another type of quarter house that uh, can be also uh, adaptable to the bed typology that we have in Kabul City. Uh, thank thank you. you very much. Very much, uh, Ustad Hosham, for your talk. Um, and and uh, there, there are already a few questions um, that we will be um, bringing to you uh, at the end. Um, so with no further delay, I would like to introduce our last speaker, um, Abdul Wasay Najimi, former teacher of architecture at Kabul University. Abdul Wasay Najimi is a conservation architect. Uh, PhD, um, educated in Denmark and currently working with the Aga Khan Trust for Culture in Kabul. He has been involved in field studies, trainings and projects in architectural conservation um, with the Aga Khan um, Trust for Culture and published articles on Afghanistan architecture and build heritage. Um, and he's also the author uh, of a book that was mentioned earlier, Herat, the Islamic City, a study in urban conservation. Uh, and the co-author of the book, uh, The Gurid Portal of the Friday Mosque of Herat. Um, so please, uh, Ustad Najimi, thank you very much for accepting the invitation to join and uh, you may start your presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation and I try to share my screen. Okay. Is the screen share? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, I have my my IT specialist beside me so you'll solve it no problem no worries but until the screen is shared uh, as i said the, thank you very much for the invitation and i am so happy to see you all and also to see sophia anayaz whom i 
first met in 2009 in Kabul University when I <clears throat> went uh, on behalf of EKPC and helped the department to teach some courses. Sophia was at that time in fifth class and I helped her in her urban design course and uh, Ayaz was at that time in second year of architecture. And I'm pleased to see them that they have now a good professional career and they're teaching others <clears throat> what we all wish to help the young architects to achieve. Is the screen okay now? Yes, it's working. Thank you very much. Okay. So the topic of <clears throat> my presentation is uh, built heritage and its conservation. And um, along that, uh, what we have been doing uh, through the QTC project in Afghanistan, uh, that will be followed by the teaching and the training of uh, young architects in conservation and preservation of historical sites. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, as you can see in the map of Afghanistan, the red spots are the cities where we have, we have worked so far. Kabul was the very first city where we started with the generous um, funds that His Highness Nia Khan provided in 2002 for the reconstruction of Afghanistan. A part uh, of other projects, EQTC started uh, work in cultural heritage. And I must say that I'm personally very much indebted to his highness generous, generous uh, uh, support because before that, some of us tried to do work in conservation, but uh, it was very difficult to raise funds. 2002 was actually the first time that we could raise funds or use EKTC funds and do these uh, conservation projects. In Kabul, we started in 2002 and continued to 2006. But then also from 2013 to 2020, in Herat from 2006 to 2011, and then in the north in Balkh 2012 to 2020, and then in Badakhshan from 2012 to 2020, which means we are still there, but the conservation projects are uh, not uh, going on. We have other projects in training and, and working with, with the young uh, students and women in, in, in training. Our very first project was Bagh Babur, as you see the picture at the top. <clears throat> it is a Mughal uh, garden established in the Timurid period in the 15th century, but then um, um, became more famous by Babur, who was the founder of Mughal dynasty, because he himself wrote in his Babur Nama uh, uh, accounts that uh, he instructed people how to make the garden, what sort of trees to plant, etc., etc. And he is buried here, therefore it's called Bagh Babur. And another famous building in this um, garden is the Shah Jahani Marble Mosque, his grandson, who came to Kabul and then in honor of his grandfather, uh, did some work in the, in the garden and, and made this um, uh, mosque. Down below you can see uh, the Akaravansai, which was established at that time, but not in the <clears throat> architecture you see today. But on the foundations of that after archaeological uh, uh, studies, we redesigned a historic uh, caravansarai with the historic architecture in mud, sorry, in, in fired bricks. And it looks very much uh, today as a very historic building. The garden is used uh, by the families and individuals, as you can see in the picture. And in 2019, there were more than 880,000 uh, visitors to the garden. And then was the work in the old city. Some of the pictures you saw in Ayaz's uh, presentation. There are houses that are all built in wood and carpentry designs. There are some mosques and there are some gardens. Uh, we tried to identify a cluster which was called the Ashikana Rapan around the, around the shrine. And then uh, most of these wooden houses existed in that area. We surveyed them with the students of Kabul University who later on got engaged in works with us. And we tried to train carpenters, masons, and people who work in, in gypsum and, and plaster, et cetera, et cetera. In the very beginning, it was very difficult actually to raise that kind of manpower. But along the projects, we managed to train people and they are still working with us. Another very challenging project in Kabul was the, uh, the restoration of the Dome of King Timur Shah who brought the capital from Kandahar to Kabul, and therefore he is famous as an architect of Kabul. 
The dome was uh, damaged by a shell during the British Afghan War in 1836. And uh, it remained damaged for a while, not as big hole as you can see here, because this is what we took away to for repair. But anyway, it was um, it was not in a good shape, and the water was leaking, so we had to open it. And it was a it was an engineering engineering challenge actually, but we learned a lot through the work. And as you can see, at that time we didn't even have scaffolding, so we used bamboo and different type of wood for, for to to work very traditionally. Now it's a public garden in the center of the city and it's used by, by people. And we usually take students there to learn about brick architecture and, and uh, sophisticated uh, dome construction, etc. And also we did some gardens. Uh, in the beginning, uh, we did uh, some gardens in, in the urban area. It's, it's actually the very first modern uh, city park <clears throat> established in 1959 and 1960s. Uh, unfortunately, after we rehabilitated the garden, it was closed. It was kept closed by the government, and the public is not allowed to use it because the municipality has an office to one side, and the palace has uh, its existence to another side. So they considered it as a security threat. So people are not visiting it. After these heavy uh, three projects in Kabul, we moved to Herat. And there we worked uh, on courtyard houses in, in one of the districts. Uh, you saw some, some similar pictures in Ayaz's presentation earlier. A lot of complicated carpentry, brickwork, and uh, as you can see the houses are courtyard. They have ponds and pools inside their courtyard for cooling, as, as he mentioned, in, in summer. And then was the covered cisterns in the two low uh, pictures. Uh, below you can see there are huge uh, cisterns, water or stored for use of, of the public. And uh, the Citadel was also uh, a huge project that was come, uh, done more or less until 2011. Another very interesting project in the bulk was the restoration of Nogombat Mosque, a mosque from 9th century, uh, has a very good uh, intricate gypsum design work much similar to Samara uh, construction in, in Iraq. And the um, uh, University from Florence was also involved in some studies and together with the as, uh, experts of the QTC, the project uh, has been uh, restored and the surrounding area has been uh, turned into a nice public uh, landscape for the use of local people. In the same area was the uh, Timurid building, uh, from uh, the 15th century. And the mosque part of this uh, building was destroyed for whatever reason. And uh, the dome was uh, damaged. So uh, the dome was repaired, the tiles were all rehabilitated, and then the mosque part was also rebuilt in the traditional architecture for the use of the community and the people. The restoration project we had in Badakhshan, the only project uh, I have photos uh, from, was the shrine of Nasr Khasrau, a famous Ismaili scholar um, who is in Yamgan village and um, has a very intricate carpentry work. And its ceiling is all in carpentry and has verses of Quran uh, written on it by hand. So uh, it was uh, uh, stabilized and uh, the carpentry was all cleaned and, and, and oiled and the roof was uh, protected and all plastered with mud. Unfortunately, after the project moved, a group of Taliban moved to the area and reportedly, we have no pictures, uh, but reportedly uh, they, they damaged some small parts of the carpentry. Then we received the funds for restoring um, and request actually from the government to restore one of the historic brick building of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And at the top two pictures, you can see the two different elevations of the, of the palace. They call it Store Palace. Originally, it was palace for one of the princes in, in, in the late 19th century but then turned to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and then uh, now it's restored and below you see the picture of the more so-called uh, restored uh, building with, with the new uh, port or uh, canopy for the, the drive-in uh, area. 
Similarly, um, uh, the garden of Chilsutun, which is another uh, building actually from, from the uh, early times. Uh, sorry, the garden was from a very ancient time. Then there was a pavilion in it. But in the 18th century, it was turned, uh, early 19th century, it was turned into a palace. And in 20th century, it was turned into a state, the guest house where the presidents and prime ministers of different countries visiting Afghanistan were actually staying here. It was badly damaged during the war of Kabul and it needed to be restored. So with the funds from the German government, we had the chance to restore the whole garden into a very nice public garden and uh, the palace itself. Uh, and now it's, um, it's used by the public. And in 2019, it had 700,000 visitors. Uh, the project that we work now in Kabul is called the um, Kabul Riverfront Transformation. Actually, it is um, around uh, old industrial establishment uh, from uh, late 19th century, but then uh, developed early 19th century. It was worked as a military factory for repair of arsenals and weapons uh, until recently, and then. Um, and the government decided actually to move all these activities out of town and let AKTC again to use the uh, German uh, financial support um, into public uh, spaces for uh, partly for commercial, partly for, for cultural spaces and some green spaces in the city because Kabul city has been pushed so much by commercial activities that uh, all the green area is, is now vanishing. So we need more spaces uh, to add uh, into, into all these different functions. But doing all these projects heavy or light, <clears throat> in 2009, we, we, we realized actually that unless we train young students in conservation and planning, uh, whatever we do might risk actually a very, uh, what do you call it, questionable maintenance status in, in future. So that was the reason that actually, um, on behalf of PKTC, I use most of my time in, in the university and help the young faculty to, to teach different courses. And along that, um, we received some funds from the US Embassy in Kabul, uh, to which we could bring uh, professors from abroad to help run short courses and intensive courses in summer or in winter. And here you can see Professor Kazumi, who was the very first graduate of architecture department in 1974. And um, he was a professor in uh, Washington State University, Pullman. Uh, generously, he uh, came to Kabul every year for, for a month session. And these are all the students and uh, some of the people sitting in this uh, table are actually now in, in very good positions in the government or in the university or private sector. Uh, <clears throat> similarly, to the studio work, this is this is actually uh, at the top is the, the studio class where Sophia was met in 2009. And um, along the work that we do in the university and uh, the teaching, we try to, or at least I try to bring out students to feel. And I take them normally to different uh, projects, to different neighborhoods, to different areas to see things for themselves and see the building material, touch the material, etc. I take them like in the sketching classes to Timur Shah, to Bagh Babu, to uh, different places to draw, sketch, and sometimes uh, document excavations. And even uh, there's a shrine very close to Kabul University, we call it Sahih Shrine, which is done in Islamic architecture or you know, the blue tile. So they, should, they, can, they should see also that because this is mostly done in Herat and Kabul students have not been to Herat. The project that I still use as a training ground is called the Godri Mosque in the old city of Kabul. It was started in 2014 and slowly we did a lot of excavations and we found the foundations by Shah Jahan who built the madrasa in Kabul old city. And on top of that was Timur Shah Duran who built uh, another mosque. And that was destroyed and uh, King Habibullah in 1910s um, built uh, something more on it and put the tin roof and then it was destroyed in 1992 to 1996 for the Kabul war. 
so as you can see, we excavated and uh, uh, sorted out a lot of old bricks that we are reusing and, and, and the material. And the, this part is, is done, and now we are doing some other parts of it. Because of the excavation, we found like subterranean foundation, which, which is now used as subterranean, uh, you call it architectural remains or, or archaeological remains. And usually uh, I take students there, or they come from different uh, universities, but mostly Kabul University, Kabul Technic University, to, uh, to learn about conservation and excavation and also people from archaeological department. These are different uh, pictures just to show you the two the excavation. They were trying to document, or they were trying to wash the, the artifacts, and they were trying to draw them. And so you have to learn all various different field activities. And some of the examples of what they found and how they drew, et cetera. And also this is uh, the places um, I'm building uh, uh, mausoleum, sorry, brickwork mausoleum and there's some uh, granary storages that are still under, under work and students of Kabul Polytechnic and Kabul University, some of the students are um, uh, Professor Ayaz's uh, construction course students. We took them out to, to, to see them, the building material and the spaces and the type of construction for themselves. And also when EKTC was uh, exhibiting different or sponsoring different exhibitions of architectural photographs from the history or by photographers, we normally bring students uh, to see that for themselves as well as to explain to them. Uh, because as, as, as I was mentioned, actually after those initial uh, research work that was done in 1970s, on the vernacular architecture and the history of Afghanistan after that actually either the teachers were not here or people immigrated out so the university's level of education got damaged and teachers were not available and we tried actually to restore all that uh, as, as, as much as we restored the building we tried to, to help the department to restore its, its capacity and its level of uh, quality education. And all through this, we learned some lessons. And the lessons that, that I have listed out here is that conservation needs funds and skilled professionals, building archaeologists, architects, planners. But there's a need for a very good coordination between the government and the department, and departmental uh, sectors, as well as the universities. And funds are needed to be uh, allocated for post conservation maintenance because usually that is where we fail you know, we do some work but then after some time we come and there's no money for the maintenance or preservation uh, of the second phases or, or, or upkeep or safeguarding and then as today i'm very thankful to you that you have uh, undertaken some such seminars seminars and publications are helpful tools to enhance dialogue and knowledge for both of the professionals and the students and with this, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Ustad and Jimmy, for this uh, uh, great presentation on, on your work and on your um, experience with vernacular architecture. Um, so, um, and, and also I would like to thank, uh, of course, uh, Sofia and, and uh, Ayaz for, for speaking earlier. And now we can actually move to the questions. Um, so I have received uh, quite a bit of questions. So uh, please don't get offended if your question is not making it through because we are trying to um, uh, distribute and, and be fair. So I would first, uh, and I will do the question by order of um, presentation. So I would uh, first start with um, uh, Sophia. Um, there were a lot of questions regarding the uh, Gazar um, uh, research that you showed. One of the questions was if you could perhaps um, contextualize uh, a little bit your uh, presentation in a larger term of your research. Um, that was that was one of the questions. Maybe I give you, um, Sophia, if that's okay, I'll give you um, maybe two questions uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of do a full cycle um, back. But so uh, that was the first question. And then um, 
if you were to see in the way that the Gaza governance uh, a necessity for it to be uh, somehow formalized um, uh, one way or the other and perhaps integrated uh, into more uh, governmental structure. Um, and, and yeah, maybe I, I'll give you the third question because I think those are related, um, whether Gozars are actually working with NGOs and if they manage to acquire funding uh, from the government and for what in that sense. Um, so Sophia, if you could um, maybe let us uh, know a little bit more about your, your, uh, your research, um, it would be great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, all are uh, very nice questions. Uh, first, I would like to also thank uh, Dr. Najimi. Uh, um, in 2009, when he was teaching us, uh, um, it was he who uh, guided me, like uh, it was his guidance that I chose urban planning as my career and did further study. So uh, here I'd like to thank him. And uh, regarding the questions about my uh, researches, uh, during my uh, master's and PhD, uh, especially um, during my PhD research, I wanted to propose uh, a neighborhood unit model uh, to guide urban development in the inner city of Kabul. Uh, on that time, uh, JICA had proposed the master plan, but um, it had um, in that it was mentioned that the master plan must be uh, complemented by the neighborhood plans or detailed plans. So uh, my my model was kind of um, guidance for uh, a guide for those. Uh, detailed plans or, or the neighborhood plans. So I uh, uh, this uh, model was uh, based on uh, famous uh, Perry's uh, neighborhood theory that was to enhance the social relations by spatial arrangements. And uh, for that, I, I, um, I tried to first study the, uh, the existing neighborhoods or communities organizations in Kabul city. And uh, for that, I, I, I um, studied the uh, Gozers. And as I mentioned that we did not have uh, any, or as uh, to the best of my, my knowledge, we did not uh, any literature uh, that, uh, that uh, was written about the uh, functions of the Gozers. So for that, I, I surveyed the Gozer functions and I found that there were still some functions working and uh, by by what I proposed as a neighborhood uh, um, model uh, for the urban guidance of Kabul city, like I wanted to uh, enhance the social functions of the gozers by some special arrangements and those special arrangements should be enhanced by social functions both. So that was uh, the overall uh, res my, my overall research. Because of that, I, I uh, studied the, the gozers. Until now, I'm I'm studying the gozers for some other reasons, or like now for for enhancing participation or something. But uh, but on that time, it was my aim of this uh, uh, research. And uh, regarding the uh, second question. Uh, Yes, uh, because there are uh, still some functions working in the Gozer, and as I did, my, my third survey was on on uh, the my third survey was on the um, on the um, social functions of the Gozers. Uh, because of that, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, so, uh, uh, a formalization is, uh, I think, very necessary because we have neighborhood function is still working. And as I said, uh, the in, we have over 70% of Kabul's uh, urban fabric as informal settlements. And this goes as act as a, a, as a kind of formal bridge for the urban governance of Kabul, Kabul city. So, it's a kind of, uh, I think, if we, we enhance these uh, functions through some special arrangements that will be nice, and if we formalize them, and if you want to formalize the, neighborhood, the, the informal settlements, uh, we should uh, use the, the, the 
car intentions of the users. And uh, regarding the, the, the third question, uh, when I went for the survey in 2013, uh, Jayaka and Yun Habitat was working with the gozers. Uh, they, uh, they were uh, like, uh, as we have some large gozers and small gozers, they were like uh, dividing these gozers into CDCs. Uh, now I don't remember the CDC is like community development uh, something like uh, it was smaller neighborhoods and then they were giving uh, some funding and uh, partial of the fund were uh, from the residents themselves and partially it was funded by those by JICA and Yun Habitat and they were working on on where on um, on the physical aspects like how to uh, repair or how to uh, have some 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 problems solved through those funds, uh, but now um, I'm not sure whether they are funded by by Kabul municipality or any other organizations. But yes, we had such kind of funds uh, fundings through Unhabitat and Jaika. Thank you very much, uh, Sofia, for your your answer and explaining more uh, your work and your research. I think this is very. Um, helpful and, and very interesting for us uh, also to, to have the, this as an example of um, governance, uh, which is uh, something that we are looking at as well. Um, so I will go to uh, Ustad Hosham and, and ask him there are a few questions. Uh, some of them are actually very close to each other and, and of course triggered by um, your comments when you were discussing the way that um, this uh, vernacular architecture is, is possibly something that we should look at, um, uh, in fact, for, for modern, modern solutions. So I think that there are a few questions and I will um, basically merge them because I think they very much ask the same and have the same concern, which is um, the fact that um, <clears throat> there are places where vernacular uh, buildings and architecture continues to evolve and there are other places where vernacular architecture is quite static and actually doesn't uh, change much. Um, so the question is how does um, Afghan vernacular architecture response uh, to modernization? So first to modern inference, so in a way if, if, uh, if it's able to accommodate uh, change uh, and then how does it also uh, response to forces of uh, modernization, probably more in a, in a negative sense. So I think there are uh, maybe two sides of the same question. How is um, Afghan vernacular architecture able to adjust? And on the other hand, what could we, uh, let's say, what could we learn? What could you see as something that would be potentially transferable in contemporary architecture, which is something we'll be also discussing next uh, session. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I, I just like I said, the vernacular architecture is something that is developed uh, based on the needs of the people. Uh, so it cannot be. Uh, I, I mean, uh, even now in Kabul, if you see the figure ground of the city, the informal settlement that uh, Professor Sufia. Uh, pointed out uh, in the informal settlement, people are unwillingly, unknowingly, I don't know how to say, it, they are still building the courtyard houses. So I guess this is a way of building, I mean, inherited in, in, in these people, uh, because that maybe best represents their needs and that solves uh, their needs without knowing their the benefits. I mean, in this case, the passive and low energy building techniques. So in Kabul, we have, I mean, I, I must have shown you the, the, the figure ground, but you can find it online. So the in the formal areas, people are building uh, following the great urban fabric. But when you go to the informal areas, far from the old city of Kabul where the courtyard houses are, the informal expansion or the informal settlements follows the courtyard uh, houses. So first I wanted to say this because this is probably something that, that uh, the indigenous way of 
building or something. But on the other hand, unfortunately, Dr. Saeed Najimi knows that in the old city of Kabul, people are destroying the courtyard houses, the beautiful courtyard houses, and they're rebuilding the, the modern contemporary houses. Uh, I mean, without any any consideration to the regional character of the of the of the region. So Afghanistan unfortunately has not responded well to, to adapt to the vernacular architecture. Uh, we were not able to, we as architects and also as educators and, and the government also were not able to tell the owners of the uh, traditional buildings the benefits of those buildings. So that's why I did this research. I mean, if you show them some figures and tell them that your house will perform better than a contemporary building uh, in, in Kabul and you will use less uh, heating and cooling energy, they, will, they, might be, uh, they might accept this and they might use, they might not destroy their houses. So I would be happy if Dr. Sir correct me and add uh, to this, but uh, it is our job to tell those, uh, the inhabitants of these houses. And also it's our job to inform the architects because it's them who are building the houses. And also the government is very cooperative in this case. I mean, in the past uh, decade, the, the government has put a lot of, uh, attention to the traditional architecture. I heard that they are even planning to, to introduce traditional settlement patterns, uh, which has the modern or the contemporary facilities of the 21st century for some of the suburban areas in Kabul. I mean, uh, the meeting we had with uh, uh, His Excellency the President last week, he, uh, he mentioned this, that they're uh, planning uh, to carry out a study or to design these type of houses together with Sasaki in the suburban areas, especially Parman, Stalif, and Surubi. So uh, I think it's a work in progress and uh, we are hopeful, actually, we are hopeful that uh, the, the people will know the value of the traditional houses, at least. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, no, I think this is extremely interesting. The, the point is uh, perhaps that I think is, a, is, a, is, a, is a quite, quite clear is that in a way um, there is kind of this economic layer if you're able to convince people that they might um, get some economical benefits by retaining, uh, you know, more vernacular uh, ways of, of construction, they could um, benefit from from it somehow. I think that's a that's a very important uh, element. Uh, so thank you very much. And actually, the question for uh, Ustad Najimi is is very close to that, and it's um, it's related to the perception of the public towards um, heritage. Um, if you've seen, let's say, a shift in the ways that this um, architecture has been perceived. Um, uh, via your work. So, of course, I think in the architecture, uh, you know, discipline and, and uh, via your work as an educator, but also more generally, if you could say that, uh, you know, the kind of, um, you know, just the people who are using this uh, type of architecture or who are maybe exposed to this architecture um, are seeing uh, more and more value into it uh, beyond the kind of economical aspect that, that um, that uh, Ayaz was mentioning. So, uh, could you could you maybe develop a little bit for us on that? Uh, and I think it, it quite it reverberates with with what um, Ustad Hosham was mentioning earlier. Well, <clears throat> my personal observation is that um, because the education system also got damaged since 1978 onward. And a lot of uh, foreign interference, whether it was Eastern Europe or I don't know whether it was Western uh, influences of, uh, you know, either you call it culture or um, material good or whatever, fear. Afghans also started uh, taking things by adoption, by copying rather than analyzing what is good, what is bad. 
for example, if you go to the heritage of um, uh, the hardware you have in the houses, you know, the, the most uh, good woolen carpet would be uh, traded out uh, for some synthetic machine made uh, carpet produced uh, in Iran or Turkey or somewhere or wall to wall, uh, wall to wall carpet. Because they have seen it somewhere else and they think this is better. It's easier to, uh, to wash. Uh, while, for example, um, the women sometimes who, who are dealing with it, you know, main, mainly the cleaning of the houses, would say that, you know, it, the traditional carpets are more heavy and it's difficult and, you know, it's, it's uh, etc. Et the same with the, with the furniture or, or other things. So, like, uh, specifically today, you see uh, most of the, the clothes wear is, is all imported from, you know, Thailand, uh, China, other places instead of being produced here locally um, and uh, i'm sometimes surprised that in facebook uh, i see comments by some people who believe that the typical afghan shalwar kameez is actually not an afghan uh, dress code it, it comes from pakistan so that means that it's similar like earlier when, when we were talking about vernacular uh, very often people even the students of architecture that maybe the architects themselves do not understand the vernacular as a vernacular that is something that is more functional, more up to the point, maybe produced by architects, maybe produced by no professional architects, or each, I mean modern architects, produced by people who produced it for a function and the function works. <clears throat> so I think um, uh, as many other things, you know, like even in the politics, you know, the opinion changes sometimes from the left to the right, from the right to the left. In, in, in architecture or, or neighborhood architecture, it will be the same. People are, in 2002, when this new <clears throat> government uh, was established, suddenly people thought that houses are needed in Kabul. So what should we do? Either they were grabbing government land to produce more uh, districts, or they were grabbing government lands through corruption to build apartment houses. And people rushed to buy these apartment houses very expensively. And now they are selling them actually half price because they can see that they are not uh, warm in winter. They are hot in summer. And sometimes the lift, the uh, awesome sword is not working because there's no electricity. And, you know, so, and, and for children, it's, it's, it's tough to be in the seven or six floor and have no access to playground uh, while as I have say that traditionally people build houses one story or two story with some courtyard or spaces so that you can immediately walk out of a closed space to an open space. Because in Afghanistan, we have nine to 10 months uh, season, seasonal uh, weather where that you enjoy to be outdoor rather than indoor. It might only be the winter two months that you like to be indoor because of the, the severe cold outside. But even then, because we always have sun and we enjoy sun, so people try to be outside, even in, in cold uh, temperature, because you can sit to a, side, uh, to a sunny side of a wall and, and, and be warm. So that these kind of things, but things that I think the mistake is of the, of the planners or the, the policy makers and the architects who cannot understand these things or they just copy from, from books or from magazines or nowadays even from internet. And you will be surprised that they are downloading a ready-made AutoCAD file of apartments built in Canada or Europe or something, and they have no correction of orientation in Kabul. We have flats that that uh, that receive no sun at all during 12 months of the year, and then we have, for example, flats that are always exposed to to sun, southern side, and you wish to have a room that was to the north side and in uh, a cold. So all these mistakes uh, that, that, for example, were identified through the studies in the 1970s are not studied today by these people. So this is why uh, also uh, Ayaz is, uh, is stressing actually the studies of vernacular architecture. And I'm also trying to emphasize it through what we are conserving and preserving and understanding all these things through that. Thank you uh, um, <clears throat> for this for this very complete answer. Um, I mean, I think uh, I mean this is a I would say this is almost a kind of universal question. There are a lot of places where you know how 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 do you manage to explain or to kind of uh, let's say 
raise awareness on the value of heritage, I think that this is a, a kind of a constant um, battle and even in, uh, in, in places that, uh, that are, you know, more, uh, let's say, uh, used to deal with heritage. I'm thinking about uh, Egypt, which, which has seen uh, recently a kind of a backlash on the way that it's been dealing with heritage, for instance, uh, after being, you know, kind of the best student uh, in terms of heritage for a long time. Uh, you've seen um, maybe maybe if you've you've followed a bit uh, the destruction of of um, a necropolis parts of the city and and uh, also kind of a general neglect uh, in terms of uh, you know the kind of care that this this, this uh, type of uh, ancient structures uh, would require and um, that is very much linked to uh, also governmental decisions. I mean, in this case, uh, you can see that the planning. Uh, so tr transportation planners just cut through, uh, you know, ancient fabric and there's very little um, care for, for these things. Uh, but you mentioned that uh, somehow also there is uh, governmental interest. Uh, so maybe one, one last question, and this could be discussed uh, by the three of you, I guess, but um, would you see uh, in, in, in the future a kind of, um, you know, uh, more focused uh, view from from authorities to 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 uh, work towards this kind of uh, on the one hand recognizing the value of, of the vernacular and on the other hand the kind of heritage uh, um, aspect uh, and and in a way I think that this could be also paired to to what Sophia has been looking at and how governments uh, could use existing uh, governance system informally if they wish if if you wish to to even uh, to even make that percolate at the level of, uh, you know, like the, the people who are not even um, in the studies, but just to, to make them aware of that. Um, so this is a question a little bit for the three of you. I'm, I'm aware that we're bleeding a little bit over time, but uh, maybe we can, we can use that to conclude. Um, so uh, um, Abdul, maybe you would like to, to give a thought about that, just some general uh, thoughts. If you think, what, what would you uh, envision for the future of uh, heritage in Afghanistan? Unless we have um, uh, programs or, or sessions in education and awareness uh, for people of uh, different uh, functions, like um, you know the architects in the university and the policymakers. In the governments and the local people in the, in the local area or districts or whatever, uh, people tend to uh, somehow, I don't know why, but it could be a psychological thing. You know, everybody wants to be modernized. And this, this word modernize could be understood differently by different people in different places and different times. But um, if the modernization is just copying things, for example, whatever they see through TV channels or dramas, and then, or they, they travel to some places and then they say, well, this is what I want, specifically when they have some free money, early, easily earned, for example, which has been the case for many people in Afghanistan. Because of the war, some people became, you know, very rich because of, you know, many people lost their lives and families and loved ones, but other people became very rich. They made a lot of, a lot of money in it to, to these, all, these, all these military operations, all these um, trades, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they don't know how to spend their money. Now they want to make a name and that, you know, they want to have something modern, something nobody has, something very big, very, you know, high class. And uh, like somebody said that uh, recently, somebody was telling me that a certain person has imported all his uh, fixtures for his bathroom from Dubai, for example, I and mean, you can buy them in Kabul, you know, made in Pakistan, made in Iran or made in somewhere. You don't need to import them from Paris or Japan or somewhere, but some people do that. So I think this is why I stress mostly, and which is also actually on the on the on the line of what His Highness the Khan has always been saying that education is a must, and that is what I'm usually dwelling on. That we have to do more training, more education, main uh, more awareness raising, and uh, through work we should show to people because. They have to see it by their eyes before they, they adopt it. 
Thank you, Abdul. Um, Ayaz, would you like to, to uh, maybe compliment a little bit or, or also tell us your, your take on this and perhaps more specifically on the vernacular um, architecture question and how you can see the kind of future onlook into this question? Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saip. Um, uh, I think that um, more than before, now the government is aware of the value of the tradition and the traditional architecture and culture. Um, but but the, the, the pace that they are building, I mean, the speed the government is building right now is not being, I mean, we are not able to catch them. The speed is very fast, especially, for instance, the government built, I mean, uh, they are planning to build 200 uh, mosques around around the country. For, so you can imagine a mosque in Kandahar in a very desert climate and a mosque in Badakhshan and another one in Bamiyan inside the, the mountains. But th there is a, a typical plan for all the mosques around the country. And if there is any changes, the changes is only in the form and stru structure or, 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 or the foundations of the mosque to fit the, the site. So what I think, um, first of all, we should be hopeful for the, for the peace. And after that, we can think about uh, these things. So uh, after that, I think we, uh, I am hopeful that we can push the government to develop, uh, I, I mean, regional or at least zonal uh, architecture typologies for different climatic zones of the country and that or uh, that or those guidelines can be used by the architects in those areas to to build at, I mean or to use for building at least regional buildings uh, I mean by regional buildings I also focus on the regional character of the building not only the fact that it should perform well under the, the local climate and it should use local material. So, uh, so first of all, uh, the government wants to do that. But uh, yeah, I think as the Kabul University, we have to find a way to propose this to the government, this, this idea. But uh, meanwhile, it takes a lot of time. I mean, it's not a sudden solution to the, to the problems that we face right now. We have to do a lot of research just like I did in, in Kabul Quartet Houses to deepen our knowledge of what's happening. And then slowly, slowly, we have to provide guidelines uh, for the builders, architects, and also municipalities to follow them and to at least produce buildings uh, that fit to the local site, local climate, and local culture. Uh, we can use the regional uh, lessons in this case. By regional lessons, I mean those provinces that are close to our Western neighbors, uh, they are also close in architecture uh, to those uh, neighbors, actually. Those provinces that are close to the Northern neighbors, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Tajikistan. They are also following the same architectural typology as, as, the, as those countries. So what we can do uh, is that we can also look for solutions in our neighbor countries. And that can be something like a shortcut to, to finding, uh, uh, how to say, um, regional guidelines for future buildings in Afghanistan. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Hayes. That was a, a really great uh, um, answer, and, and I think uh, regional guidelines are, are definitely something we should um, we should keep in mind uh, also for our studios. So uh, may I ask Sophia to to uh, take the final word and maybe tell us a little bit how um, what she sees for the kind of Gozard network uh, as something that could be potentially um, useful. Uh, for the future and, and also how somehow in the informal context it could be uh, a potential to, to even actually reflect on what uh, both uh, um, uh, Ustad Najimi and, and Ustad Hosham mentioned uh, in terms of uh, perhaps sensibilizing um, uh, the people who build uh, to, to, to actually keep this in mind.
Sofia, are you still here? Okay, I think Sophia might be uh, might be uh, uh, cannot answer right now. So, um, well, uh, I mean, it would have been interesting to know, but I guess we could uh, also uh, look into her literature and, and find maybe an answer to that. Uh, um, so, I will basically uh, wrap up and thank you uh, for your presentation and and um, agreeing to to contribute to this uh, session today. Sophia Sahab, Ayaz Hosham, and Abdul Wasai Najimi. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure to, to uh, watch your presentation and also discuss with you uh, somehow the um, question of, of vernacular and heritage and, and governance in um, Afghanistan. And this has been a very enriching um, conversation. And also thank you very much to the audience uh, for the questions. Um, I hope I was able to convey them as, as uh, well as possible. Um, uh, so I think we, we uh, are fulfilling the hope that we had to, to get a sense of the challenges and the assets that uh, traditional and vernacular architecture in Afghanistan um, face. Uh, and I would like to conclude by thanking again the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asian Institute for allowing us to set up um, the sessions as they are. Um, and uh, also would like to remind you of our next session on contemporary architecture and urbanism in Afghanistan, which will be um, taking place on October 24th with another set of guests uh, on the same channels. Um, so uh, with this, I would like to thank you and um, hope to uh, see some of you uh, uh, at the next session. Thank you very much. <laughs>